Amnesia The Dark Descent is one of the best examples of the right game coming out at the right time. First, at its release in September 2010, horror games were in a lull period. The prior few years saw the rise of action horror titles in the wake of RE4, dialing up on action while dialing down the survival elements. The seventh generation offered slim pickings for survival horror compared to the sixth. Second, The Dark Descent released during the rapid rise of the indie title. Digital distribution like Steam and Xbox Live Arcade made it easy to publish your game. Third, it released during the rise of the Let's Player, a game that was perfect for it. Many found Amnesia too scary to play themselves, but they loved watching others get scared. Even if you strip all these factors away, it was so well received due to being one of the best showings of horror in a game. All these years later, it still is. Light on mechanics, but delivers a horror experience that few can compete with. Instead of jump scares, it focuses on the fear of the unknown, what's there in the dark. It built an experience that stuck with you long after you finished playing. It's one of the most influential titles from the 2010s. Many indies have tried to copy its style with only a few coming close. You can feel its influence in large budget horror titles to this day. It's arguable that developer fictional games would top it with Soma. That said, the two Amnesia sequels have failed to reach the highs of The Dark Descent. I am very curious about Amnesia The Bunker as of writing an upcoming release set in a World War I bunker. Something to tie me over until another survival horror title set in World War I, Conscript, releases. As a result, I want to revisit The Dark Descent, which I haven't played since its release. And time has been very kind to it, despite how many titles took heavy influence from it. From large budget horror, to walking simulators, to streamer bait indie titles. At its core, The Dark Descent delivers a horror experience that few can compete with. Stay close. Be careful not to stray. What's the reason? Why is it so dark? Pay attention, Daniel. It's important that you keep going straight and make sure not to stray. A few notes before jumping in. Due to how YouTube handles dark footage, I recommend viewing at 1440p. I also brightened up the footage by a small degree in post for use of viewing. So what you're seeing is a bit brighter than how I played. The year is 1839. We play as Daniel. He's awakened in Brennenburg Castle in Prussia, with little memory of who he is and how he got here. My name is Daniel. I live in London at, at uh, Mayfair. What have I done? This is crazy. Don't forget. Don't forget. I must stop him. Focus. My name is... is... I am Daniel. After a brief tutorial, we find a note from Daniel's past self that gives insight into what's going on. Don't be afraid, Daniel. I can't tell you why, but know this. I choose to forget. Try to find comfort and strength in that fact. There is a purpose. You are my final effort to put things right. God willing, the name Alexander of Brandenburg still invokes bitter anger in you. If not, this will sound horrible. Go to the inner sanctum. Find Alexander and kill him. His body is old and weak, and yours, young and strong. He will be no match for you. One last thing. A shadow is following you. It's a living nightmare, breaking down reality. I have tried everything, and there is no way to fight back. You need to escape it as long as you can. Redeem us both. Daniel, descend into the darkness where Alexander waits and murder him. Your former self, Daniel. With that simple premise, we're off into the dark descent that awaits us. And boy do things get dark, both from a figurative and literal standpoint. From a gameplay standpoint, Amnesia The Dark Descent is minimal, but makes the most out of them to deliver a horror experience where you feel helpless. One key element is light. We need to traverse our way through these dark halls. We have a couple of options for light. First, we could pick up tinder boxes to light various objects. Candles, torches, lamps. For mobile source, we have a lantern, but this requires oil to use. Both these sources come in limited supply. It's easy to run out of both. You don't want to be lighting every single light source with your limited tinder boxes. As well, you don't want to be burning through your oil supply. As a result, you'll be spending time in darkness. Daniel has an averse fear of the dark. And what happens in the dark? Well, that's where things get very interesting with the sanity system. The more time you spend in the dark or seeing unsettling events or creatures that go bump in the night, the lower it gets. Stepping into a light source will replenish it, but only to a certain degree. For full restoration, you need to find key items or solve a puzzle. 
There's a pleasing sound and visual cue when this occurs. Interesting happenings occur with lower sanity. What sounds like teeth grinding occurs. Although Frictional said it wasn't teeth grinding. Vision becomes blurry. We hear sounds that aren't there. Daniel begins to talk to himself. Movement can slow down and have delayed input. Some areas of the game have unique occurrences, like the one I started the video with. It's a portrait of Alexander, Baron of Brennenberg Castle. It looks different depending on her sanity level. Other paintings will change throughout the game. But under the hood, the sanity meter has an interesting trick up its sleeve, and it's the fact that the game lies to you about it on a number of factors. This information was revealed by the game's creative director in an interview. So what we did was that sanity was still a number. Player could still go insane, hallucinate, and so on, and it eventually collapse underground from lack of mental health. But that didn't influence the game at all. If the player collapsed, could get up and continue going. So there was no balancing need for us anymore. So instead, we had basically nothing. <laughs> we had a sanity meter, we had some sanity effects, and then there was no real fail state. And it worked better. And then we don't really say what the consequences are for this. But the player assumes, right? If you're gonna lose your mind, I'm not gonna be able to play him. He might die, he might, you know, be harder to control, he might attract the attention of monsters, and so on and so forth. If you're going to trick the player about how mechanics work, what better place to do so than a horror title? It gets the player to fill in some of the blanks on their own and make for a better horror experience. And this sanity system has played a large part in how memorable the game is. Sanity systems are something that few games have made use of, but there is a reason for that. I talked about it in my video on the 2002 title Eternal Darkness. Nintendo filed a patent on the Sandy system, something they would never use again, and the patent expired in 2021. Looking at the patent history, there never seemed to be any legal action taken against others. Considering how protective Nintendo can be about their IP, I'm surprised that was the case. Especially here, yes, Frictional flew under the radar until the game's release. They were and still are a small studio, but with all the attention Amnesia got, I'm surprised Nintendo never tried anything. Possible they thought about it but didn't have a strong case that what Amnesia used was distinct enough that they couldn't go after them. Patenting video game mechanics is a silly thing, especially the fact that Nintendo sat on it for so long and did jack with it. To think of all the games over the years that could have made strong use of it, but had to be concerned about a letter from Nintendo's lawyers, it is quite disappointing. But hey, that patent has now been expired since late 2021, so go crazy, horror devs. So what are these things that go bump in the night with Amnesia? Despite a short title, the game doesn't rush into things. It's a fantastic build to that first encounter with a monster of the castle. There is plenty of time between encounters. Enough of breathing room not only for relief, but dread and anticipation of the next. They're spread out at the right length to keep you on edge. What we're up against? Well, we have no means of defense beyond hiding or running. Something that's common now, but was quite novel at the time. It played a large part of the rise of hide-and-seek horror gameplay. Similar to stealth, but not quite. Silent Hill Shattered Memories, which came out the year before Amnesia, did the same. No combat choices, only running and hiding. There are two kinds of creatures we'll encounter, the grunt and the brute. If you've been spotted, good luck escaping. And you'll know when they spot you due to the change in sandy and the change of sound of them approaching. Due to the low sandy and low light, you only get a brief glimpse of them before they kill you. They'll kill you quick enough that you don't get much of a good look at them. They don't lose much of an impact as a result. The fear of the unknown, what the mind can conjure up to fill in the blanks, will always be the greatest generator of fear. Of course, the best example of this is the invisible water monster. Anyone who's played Dark Descent knows this moment. The one that we have to stay out of the water or it'll hunt us down. It's 
It's a wonderful section, turning valves to open doors for a limited period of time, building urgency. It also lasts the right amount of time. Years later, it's still a well-executed, memorable encounter in one of the game's highlights. What makes this a memorable moment is the relief that comes afterwards. A safe, well-lit hall that branches off to many areas. The soothing music telling you you're safe. But it's only temporary relief. The shadow, a presence throughout, makes itself known the next time through. This gooey substance starts to fill up the halls. There's been a change in music. It's lost that feeling of safety, and one that never returns. The music and sound design are key to a well-executed horror title, and Amnesia knocks it out of the park. Low, droning ambient tracks filling up the halls always keeps us on edge. Tracks that play during encounters with enemies pick up the pace, but never enter the realm of Hollywood horror. They're all memorable and have stuck with me throughout the years. Back to the invisible monster. There's another section later that involves turning valves in a room full of water. Of course, you're on edge the entire time, waiting for one. You hear various noises that seems like you're going to encounter another water monster. You turn the last valve. You know what that means in horror games. Found that key item or solved that puzzle? Here come the monsters. But nothing shows up. Nothing ever attacks you in this section, but you're on edge the entire time. It's brilliant with how much this mucks with you. It's something I wish more horror games wouldn't be afraid to do. Don't always have the predictable event of something coming after us when we pick up a key item. Sure, if you're replaying the game, you know you're safe. That said, the lack of monster makes us one of the game's most memorable sections. Another brilliant case of the game getting the player to fill in the blanks and tricking themselves. On the note of pick up a key item to spawn an enemy, Amnesia makes use of it as well, but there's one scene in particular where it's quite brilliant. There's a guest room, a small loaded off section with three rooms. It seems like more of a narrative section. Some flashbacks, some notes, find a key that you're looking for. You find the key, head to the entrance, and then a grunt breaks his way in. Luckily, you have time to hide in a closet nearby. Due to the size of this loaded off area, it does come as a surprise. It's one of the best uses of have a monster spawn after finding a key item. If you do get killed by these grunts or brutes, they will spawn less. As a result, after enough deaths, a section may be clear monsters. The developers want to give some challenge, but not to the verge of frustration if you couldn't do so, where frustration replaces fear. It's not like you have many options for dealing with them, and for what the game is going for, it's fine in my books. There are a few simple puzzles along the way. Some will get you to pause for a few moments, but they don't grind the game to a halt as you try to map things out. There are also some physics-based ones of knocking things over or moving things around. Ways to keep things fresh without getting over-reliant on always dealing with horror. A strong, compelling narrative is key for horror with light mechanics, and Amnesia delivers in droves. At its core, it's a simple story. As I mentioned at the beginning of the video, Daniel discovers a note from his past self. He has a little memory of what happened prior. All he knows is that his past self has told him to kill Alexander, Baron of Brennenburg Castle. It's through our journey that will fit the pieces of the puzzle. Daniel will have flashbacks throughout, most focused on conversations he's had with Alexander. Some give indication of what we should do next or where we should go. Others build tension and dread of what's around the next corner. But we won't be losing it. Not today. The flow is seasonal, and when the spring runs dry, the damp tunnels produce a rather poisonous type of fungi. There is an antidote, of course, but we won't be bothering with it today. Come, this way instead. We're almost there. There are many notes spread throughout the castle, many from Daniel to help put the pieces together of what happened. It takes its time in unraveling everything that occurred prior. What we end up with is a compelling narrative that's easy to follow, yet there's much left for the player to fill in the blanks. It pulls heavily from the style of HP Lovecraft, but a bit more grounded. Finding an orb during an expedition, Daniel leaves a trail of death as he tries to escape the shadow. It's what brings him to visit Alexander, a man who turns out not to be of this world and has been stuck here for centuries. There are small bits here and there where we learn about his past, 
but only hints of it. Enough to paint a picture, but vague enough to let the player fill in the blanks and the details. Where the dark descent gets dark beyond these halls comes from what Alexander needs to do to return to his world. Beyond the orb, Alexander needs to generate enough of a substance through torture. He manipulates Daniel into helping him with these tortures. They make use of an amnesia potion to wipe the memories of past torture. That way, they could generate the most amount of substance. One of the game's highlights is visiting these torture chambers, with some unsettling sound design droning in the background, something that sounds like a church bell. There's a picture on the wall of how these devices work. Through flashbacks and background noises, the player fills in the rest in their mind. They're some of the more unsettling moments I've come across in the game. Daniel is doing whatever he can to remove the pursuit of the shadow. Alexander tricks him, telling him that this will help Daniel remove the shadow. In actuality, he's preparing for his ritual to return to his world. He's tricked Daniel into thinking he's killing criminals when that's not the case. What finally breaks Daniel is the realization of him killing of innocents. Unable to cope, he leaves a trail for himself to follow and drinks an amnesia potion to forget. Now he seeks to redeem himself by killing Alexander. The use of amnesia can be a cliched storytelling technique, but it's used well here. It doesn't only have a single plot purpose, a cheat to build a story with suspense. Most of what we hear in flashbacks will be with Daniel and Alexander. I have to commend how strongly voice acting is for both of them. Alexander, I will kill you for what you have done. If only the shadow had caught me in London or Algeria, I wouldn't have to suffer this humiliation. You made me a murderer. A monster! Is this guilt I am witnessing, Dan? If so, blame yourself. You started this. You sent me that letter asking for help, and this is how you repay me? How dare you! But in the last stretch, we'll come across Agrippa, a man prominent in the notes throughout the castle. He's based on an actual historical figure. Alexander has trapped him for a very long time. Centuries. All things considered, he's pretty chipper. Daniel? Like the prophet thrown into the lion's den? <laughs> Tell me, are you among the lions, Daniel? A friend for comfort in the last stretch of the game. A sense of relief to return to with a warm greeting. Although he could talk a little too much, I found at points. Throughout the game, the pacing is stellar. Each section will have a straightforward objective, but a roadblock will pop up along the way. Machinery that's busted or needs fueling. Locked doors. Along the way, we'll come across even more roadblocks, like the monsters of the castle. It's all paced to keep you on edge and moving things forward. There is one exception I found. The part near the end where a bunch of grunts descend on you and send you to a jail cell. It felt like a momentum killer back then, and it still feels that way now. That said, there is a great chase section of running from the shadow. It felt like they needed to make a new area to have this chase play out. If you cut this section, the game would have been better off. It's not bad, but it does stick out like a sore thumb. It loses a bit of that momentum of approaching the end game. We finally reach the inner sanctum, finally coming face to face with Alexander. There is something goofy with him floating around with his little Brennenberg hanging out. And for a ritual that's taken centuries to prepare, it's also a bit silly we could ruin it by pushing over three pillars. With that, we have three possible endings. One in which we stop the ritual, getting our revenge. One in which we let him complete it and return, resulting in Daniel's death. Or one in which he opens the portal, but we ruin it by throwing Agrippa's head in. With that, we get the most interesting, ambiguous ending. There he is. Do you see him, Vaya? He deserves so much more. Please, help him. I know you can. Don't worry, Daniel. It will be all right. And so ends The Dark Descent. It still holds up well considering how many horror titles have lifted from it since, especially in the indie realm. But that's the case with most pieces of influential media. Many will copy it at the surface level, but miss what goes on underneath. As I mentioned at the start of this video, Amnesia was a title to come out at just the right time. It's one of the first major titles to benefit from the rise of Let's Plays. What started on forums with text and pictures was moving to YouTube and streaming. Amnesia was a game that was too scary for many. That said, they love watching others get scared. Without a large marketing budget, Let's Players did the heavy work of promoting the game. It became a viable marketing strategy moving forward. Amnesia would also help 
help launch a number of Let's Players into the stratosphere, PewDiePie being one of them, someone that was the most subscribed YouTuber for a long period of time. Markiplier is another example. As of writing, he just announced that he'll be directing a film adaptation of the horror game Iron Lung. Many streamers have come and gone from this time. Hell, some are still plugging away with their raw gameplay approach. And then came the Twitch bait titles. Games built around the idea of being streaming friendly. With the growing ease of publishing and developing game, indie titles came out in droves. I know it's easy to poke fun at the AAA gaming space for how derivative games can be, that indie games are where it's at for originality, but there's been so many cases of games trying to bank on the success of Amnesia. Some did. Some were flavors of the month before people forgot about them and moved on to the next one. But over a decade later, few have managed to capture what Amnesia did. One of them is fictional games themselves. You can make a strong case for them topping the Dark Descent with Soma, something I plan on looking at for another day. But there is a reason that The Dark Descent has stood the test of time. Its execution of horror is unmatched save for a few titles since, often duplicated and never imitated, something the series itself has struggled with. Here's to hoping that the bunker can live up to it. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe, leave a comment if you haven't done so. If you want to support the channel further, consider checking out my Patreon. Thanks everyone. Boulder Punch out. that I did not. He unearthed a number of carbon temples and gathered a whole collection of orbs. But unlike every other finder since the fall of the Israel thing, he was able to unshackle the heart you and I connected with the orbs. He used them and was able to travel far and wide beyond the world itself.